to uh, next uh, second of the distinguished speaker series talk. Um, we are thrilled to have Sriram Natarajan for this distinguished speaking uh, talk, uh, speaker talk. Um, so Sriram um, is an associate professor at uh, University of Texas Dallas. Uh, I have known him for some time. Um, uh, he, his early work was in uh, relational learning. Uh, he's done work on uh, reinforcement learning, graph <coughs> models, and so these are all yeah, right now um, exciting parts of the AI and machine learning community. Um, he has been uh, program chair, co-chair of uh, uh, one of the CM conferences in data mining and another conference, and um, he's been part of some of the major grants uh, from DARPA and uh, NSF and, and so on. Um, in, in his interest has also been in health, where uh, some of the interest of my group has been. Uh, it's an exciting area. Uh, and um, I've seen his keynote generally in this area and uh, felt that that's something very exciting for us. And hence, uh, we are delighted to have Sirav here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, so, uh, and thanks for the very nice uh, introduction. So I'm uh, Sriram and I'm here to talk about human allied artificial intelligence uh, and we'll, I'll explain uh, what these things mean as we go. But uh, the key thing I want to take away in this slide is it's a human allied AI. So we are not in an adversarial setting. Um, uh, I like to think a little bit positive. So human and machines working together to make lives better. Okay, so that's the hope of, of this talk. Um, so it's a thank to all my collaborators, my PhD students particularly. We have a lab of I think 12 or 13 PhD students, um, a few PhD students have graduated and actually a lot of master's students who have contributed to these projects um, and a lot of computer science collaborators and uh, definitely uh, my clinical collaborators and of course thanks to uh, the various funding agencies. So this is who we are. Uh, we are uh, a bunch of people uh, interested in AI and machine learning, uh, getting humans and AI machines to work together, um, and we uh, uh, we are solving uh, several real problems that we are interested in. So, once we know who we are, so what do we do, right? So we are the Starling Lab, um, and the way I like to think about our research is we develop algorithms, uh, fundamental algorithms in this inner uh, set of hexagons um, by being inspired from problems from the outs uh, outer set. So we look at a problem uh, from the outer set and then develop specific solutions, right? So it's easy to easy to develop a hammer and then start searching for a nail uh, that fits that hammer. Uh, I'm hoping that, that our lab would, would do the opposite. We can find a problem, find what technique is out there, find if you can improve it and, and then uh, build upon it. So, so for instance, uh, like Professor Shep mentioned, we work in reinforcement learning, uh, classical machine learning, statistical relational uh, learning, which is much more on symbolic learning and yeah, now uh, after the recent uh, AAAI, the notion of symbolic AI has again caught up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's the way it keeps comes and going, right? So, uh, and then uh, of course we are always interested in human loop learning. Um, the problems that we look at all the way go from uh, healthcare problems. Uh, uh, my earliest uh, healthcare exposure, my PhD thesis had not a single word uh, of health in it. I did a control app. There was no health in it, right? But then I moved to Wisconsin and then I started working at the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Computer Science with Professors uh, Jude Chavlik and David Page. And they introduced me to healthcare tasks. So we started looking at electronic health records, um, in predicting heart attacks, and then predicting cardiovascular uh, disorders and issues in general. Um, and then we started working on uh, um, different types of healthcare problems, predicting side effects of drugs. Um, and when I joined Wake Forest, we started working with the neuroradiology group on predicting early onset of Alzheimer's, um, predicting uh, traumatic brain injuries uh, for food from football data. People who are playing football. Can we predict these uh, traumatic uh, brain injuries? Um, and then recently, we've been working with several companies on things like their logistics problem, um, uh, warehousing problem, inventory control problems, and so on. So we have this uh, whole range of uh, problems that we are working on. For each problem, we look at the specific toolkit that we have and figure out if we have a hammer. And if not, how do we modify the hammer? So, so that's what we do, right? So with that introduction, jumping straight in, the key question that I have asked in uh, human allied AI is, can we build AI systems that can uh, interact with, learn from, collaborate with, and this is the most important thing that I recently added, potentially teach the human expert, okay? So 
we want to be able to not just say data is everything because big data really is, is kind of useless because uh, you just have so much data, you're picking correlations instead of real interesting uh, connections, right? So the question that we are asking is, if we have access to a human uh, who's been working with it, why, why do we uh, discard uh, him or her knowledge on, on these problems? Why can't we use her to give uh, appropriate bias, appropriate guidance in learn, making these algorithms learn better, right? Um, the cool thing that we are recently seeing is we can actually identify new things and, and potentially teach the expert back, hey, you said A causes B, but maybe A causes C, which causes B, okay? And so, so for instance, in an example, we saw that uh, maybe uh, um, in one of the side effects of drugs, I think um, we are do, looking at COX-2 inhibitors and we thought COX-2 inhibitors cause heart attack, okay? One of the important side effects of COX-2 inhibitors was heart attack, right? But we also saw that one of the important side effects of COX-2 inhibitor was an elevated glucose level, okay? So maybe it's actually the heart attack is caused due to the elevated glucose level uh, of these COX-2 inhibitors. We don't know that yet. We can't do the clinical trial on it because they are done, right? It's 2004. We have withdrawn all the drugs. There's no more drugs out there. So, but the point is the data can tell you something more than, than, uh, uh, than what we know, right? But the expert can help us learn better with the data. So we want to be able to uh, leverage uh, both the data and the humans that work with the data. So in our human allied framework, this is what we are thinking of, right? So we have this agent, which we are calling as a, a starling agent. Let's let's think of just simple clinical uh, practice as examples. And, and here, what we can do is we can um, go all the way from making predictions, um, making suggestions, uh, explanations, plans, and the human can, uh, and ask the human some more explanations, get a response, update its model, and maybe uh, 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 teach back to the human. Maybe we can even find good data, new data that could improve the model, suggest those data to the human. Hey, you know, in this clinical study on predicting postpartum depression in women, you, you've got this population. What you are missing is this particular population. So why don't you go to this uh, city and see if you can recruit some women and we can uh, work with them, right? So you can give suggestions back to the human on even how to collect the data. Now, uh, I have this example running all the time uh, that I give in 2000. 14 or 15, uh, we went to uh, 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 urgent care because, you know, I, I think twisted my knee or something. And, and we were sitting there, the physician is asking me questions, right? Uh, I'm a professor, so I was very busy doing this. And the uh, uh, physician is asking me a bunch of questions and I'm answering everything, half on, you know, half concentration there. And then at the end of the clinic, uh, the, uh, the physician asks me, have you told me everything? I said, yes, right? And then my wife uh, gives me a nice back in the back, right? Just like one part. But she's pretty, so it won't hurt. Um, so, but the thing is, I was like, why did you do this? Another point was, you have diabetes, you didn't tell him, right? Possibly the single most inf important information that he needed to know, because he was going to prescribe me a steroid, right? And he needed to know that, right? It's not like I have a taboo, I've told everyone that I have diabetes, so I could have told him, right? But it's just that my concentration levels were not there. The, the urgent care system is not integrated into my electronic health record. Right? But imagine that if you have a system that is in integrated and it basically says, hey, I know you, you're trying to prescribe a, a steroid for him, uh, he has diabetes, what do you plan to do? Right? Or should you go ahead with this? And the physician could say things like, no, 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 he's in acute pain, let's bring that down first and I can supplement his diabetes medication with this. Or the physician could say, oh great, he didn't tell me, you told me, thank you, we can go for some other treatment. So we want to have that level of a natural interaction between the machine and the humans. That's the goal. And, and together, develop some good treatment plans. Um, imagine this, right? So physicians are so overburdened, right? I think the average time that a physician spends with a patient um, in, in the normal family uh, clinic is like two and a half minutes, okay? That's all they have to make a diagnosis and give you something, right? Where do they have data on the new discovery that has been made? New drug uh, uh, disease associations that has been made? New side effects that has been discovered? But a machine can crawl the web, machine can read it. Um, uh, it has uh, access to the NIH, uh, PubMed, etc. It can get everything together. It can build a model and it can update back to the human. So that's the hope that we are having uh, uh, in this human-machine interaction, okay? So that's the big picture. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. It's not very, very easy. The data is in different types, different formats, um, different modalities of information. Uh, data occur at different scale, right? So, for instance, I'm uh, I go to the hospital maybe once in two to three months. Um, uh, uh, Revati here, she looks fit. She probably goes once in two to three years. So, we have different amounts of data from each of us. The scale at which we get data from each individual varies. How do we standardize this? 
forcing all us, all of us into one vectorized representation is going to lose a lot of information or in the other case it's going to impute a lot of information which may not actually be relevant to your problem at task. So how do we handle that uh, scale? Of course different frequencies in which uh, data stream occurs, right? They are not going to take your images every time. They are not going to just poke blood into you every time, right? But they get the other data uh, about you all the time. So even your own data comes at uh, different intervals. And of course then I think as you go from top to down, I, I think it's the problem becomes harder and harder. There is noise in the sensor. Um, the knowledge changes with time. That's the bigger problem, right? We thought, so the, the best example is always nutrition, right? Uh, in, in particular, uh, the keto diet was great last year. It's uh, already uh, like CNN. CNN is the best example for this all the time, right? You can crawl CNN and get these things. Last year, keto diet was best. The previous year, some detox diet was best. This year, the Mediterranean diet is back to them being number one in the CNN article. So, this, this so-called knowledge keeps changing over time. How do you adapt to this knowledge? How do you keep abreast with this knowledge when you are building these learning agents, right? Um, of course, the long-term side effects of your actions, the long-term results of what you have done as an intervention, you don't really know. You can measure the short-term interactions, but you don't really know what has happened in the longer term. That's a harder challenge for us because we don't even have the data, right? And same thing with the partial observability and the long-term effects. But what do you think is the most important challenge in a human allied AI system? Trust. Trust. I agree. That's from the human to the machine. Right. Transparency is not there. Yes. So that's from the human side. From a machine side, what do you think is the most important challenge? Accuracy. Maybe. Anything else? Accuracy could be one. Humans. <laughs> we are the biggest challenge, right? We are always approximate. We wing it, to say, so to say. Right? If I ask many of you, what time should I leave to get to the flight? Today I have a flight at 7.45. What time should I leave to get to the flight? Each of you is going to give me an answer. Okay? One of you might say 6.30 because it takes 15 minutes. One hour you should breeze through. Some of you are daredevils, 6.45, 7. Right? Some of you are cautious, 5.45, 6. If my dad was in the room, 3.30 <laughs> yeah. in the morning. Right. I live five kilometers from the uh, airport in Madras and he, he, he wants me to leave four hours before the flight. <laughs> I could walk to my airport with my luggage and that, but, but he, he likes to be cautious. But, you know, in his, in his uh, this thing, he has never missed a flight, okay? So my point is each of us is approximate, but we expect the machine to be exact. We are very unpredictable, right? If I give you the same recommendation today, and yesterday, you're going to react to it in two different ways because of whatever is happening inside your head. How do I know that, right? So that's the problem. Understanding and building a model of a human is the most crucial aspect of human allied data. Okay? And I think this is where we are really scratching the surface. Because, and this is where, why I feel doing AI without cognitive science is the wrong way to do things. We really need cognitive uh, science experts inside AI to do this, right? Because we have to understand humans if you're going to deploy uh, any uh, AI system in the real world, right? So what I think as three steps of uh, uh, human allied AI, right? So in the first foundational step, of course, like you beautifully said, accuracy is extremely important. So you want to build systems that are predictive. So I'm not saying that the current deep learning uh, uh, trend is bad. You need that, okay? That's your foundational layer. You want to have an efficient learning method, right? So you, you, you want to have things that can learn only from data. They need to be effective. In, in building a good accurate model, they need to be efficient in learning from a small set of samples or a given set of samples. We need to be able to generalize this, we need to be able to personalize this. Of course, nowadays there is also this hope that we, we should be able to explain this back to the human. But the problem with these methods is they ignore human knowledge. So in my head, the next step in the ladder is how can we bring the knowledge into the human, okay? So we need to allow for richer forms of inputs. Let's not, let's, let's, just because I'm hyping up machines, I'm not saying humans are morons, right? So we know a lot of things. We have gained knowledge for, in, in some problems for decades, in some for centuries, in, in some for millennia. We have a lot of knowledge that we have acquired. Why should we throw that knowledge? How can we get that knowledge? Human is not there as a mere labeler who's going to say, yes, this is a positive example, this is a negative example. One of my pet peeves against this area uh, called active learning is that we are basically asking the human to just label data. Okay, but that's not enough. The humans have knowledge. We should be able to get that knowledge back into the system. So there's been a lot of work again for more than 30 years on what are called advice taking systems, which can take richer forms of input as advice to a machine learning system.
Okay, and the third uh, uh, step in this ladder, probably the most important step for me, is closing the loop. Okay, the system should know what it knows and ask question about what it does not know. Okay, so how can I make a system know what it knows? Ask question about what it does not know. Uh, in, in some sense, in, in some sense, like a, st a student-teacher interaction. Imagine doing this. I'm just standing here talking blah 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 all the time, and I'm giving you a lot of advice, and you are never asked allowed to ask me questions, right? That is not the best way to do, right? Because you have a different model than I do about what I'm saying. And so if you can explain to me what your model is and say that this is the gap that I want to fill, then maybe I can help you fill that gap, okay? So that's the uh, uh, whole point of here uh, where I'm saying close the loop, right? So know what you know and ask what you do not know, kind of emulating a student-teacher interaction. And in this, the hope is that if you do this long enough, the system may teach back to the human, right? My four-year-old, uh, I keep teaching him, but he teaches me back uh, new things every now and then. Uh, he's even about things that are good and bad. He's like, I'm not a bad boy, right? I said, no, you just did a bad thing. And then he, then he taught me the difference between being a bad boy and doing a bad thing. So he asked me this question. So where, what makes me a bad boy? If I do too many bad things, right? So you, you understand that that's how they are thinking, right? Now, that's a gap that I have, right? I have this absolute notion of what a good and a bad behavior is and good and a bad boy is. And he's telling me the difference, right? So now you learn and you learn how to communicate better. So that's the hope that we have. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next, uh, I guess, 30 minutes ish is spend 10 minutes on each of those ladder. Okay, so what we will do is I'll first 10 minutes I'm going to talk about effective learning. Oops, I just went like crazy, sorry. So the fundamental uh, effective uh, knowledge, uh, I mean, effective learning technique that we are basing on is this notion of knowledge, uh, I mean, sorry, gradient, functional gradient boosting, okay? Functional gradient boosting works like this. So I take a, a model, the current model, which could be an initial uh, bias. In many cases, it's a uniform distribution. We are in the classification setting to start with, okay? So I'm taking an initial model. It could be just a uniform distribution over your labels. Um, it could be an initial model that a domain expert gave something, okay? And then I'm going to make a prediction on, on, that, uh, on the data using this model. I'm computing the difference between the data and the prediction. They become what are called gradients. And then I'm going to fit the gradient to the uh, next one, okay, um, in the next step. And then I'm going to add the gradient to that model, uh, the current model, the new model. And then I'm going to make new predictions, compute new gradients, introduce a new smaller model, and keep iterating until convergence, okay. Now this is as abstract as it can be, okay, let's ground it out. Let's say we are predicting heart attacks, okay. In the data, let's say that Sriram has a heart attack. Okay, Manas looks healthy, so he does not have a heart attack. Okay, now uh, what happens is my initial model, the first model, or maybe just these three trees together, predicts that Sriram has a heart attack with a probability of 0.87. Okay, Sriram has have, had a heart attack with a 0.87 probability. And it says Manas does not have a heart attack with, uh, sorry, Manas has a heart attack with a probability of 0.16. So my probability of heart attack is 0.87, this is 0.16. Okay. I am a positive example. So what should my probability be? It's one, right? My probability should be one. So one minus 0 0.87, 0 0.13 is my gradient, okay? His should be zero. Zero minus 0 0.16, negative 0 0.16 is his gradient. So my gradient is 0 0.13, my, uh, his is negative 0 0.16. So the next tree, it's not going to go for 0 and 1. It's only going to learn 0.13 for me and negative 0.16 for him and it's going to go towards that. Okay, so it's not going to be a strong one. It's going to be a weak one, which is only get, trying to get my 0.13 uh, error correct. Okay, in the next iteration, maybe my probability now becomes 0.94 for him becomes 0 0.09. So this is negative 0 0.09 minus 0 0.06. So the next tree is going to only learn that. Does it make sense? So the cool thing is all the positive examples will be pushed towards 1 and all the negative examples will be pushed towards 0. So that will be in the context of additional data that comes in there. No, it's the same data set. In the same data set, I'm making, I'm figuring out so how much so mistakes I'm making. Are you also improving the original model? You will. Okay. That's the whole point. Because okay. you're going from 0.87 to 0.94 and from 0.94 I could go to 0.965 and 989 and I'm making small steps towards going towards that one. And each small model that you learn in the middle is going to take that gradient step towards that. Okay, so that, that is why it's called gradient boosting. Uh, your, those are what are called gradients and you're boosting the gradients um, 
in, in that functional space and why how we do it I'm kind of abstracting now for the broader uh, talk. So you do this uh, until convergence uh, you have some excellent excellent results. So this was actually introduced by Jerome Friedman in 2001 um, adapted for the first time in machine learning by Tom Dietrich um, and his students Adam Passionfelter for uh, the conditional random fields in 2004. Um, then um, there's been a lot of work on gradient boosting. Most people who are taking machine learning now knows one form of this as XG boost um, that exists inside uh, many of these uh, uh, publicly available libraries like Scifit. Okay, so the XG boost is one instance of uh, doing this. So what we have done in our lab is we have learned many many different types of models, uh, particularly on on rich relational databases. So databases where you don't have nice vectorized format, right? So for instance, I'm predicting the popularity of a person. Some of you may have, uh, I don't know, uh, 200 friends, 300 friends like me on Facebook. And some of you may have 1500, 1600 friends. Some of you may have 2000 friends. And you might think, oh, I'm very popular uh, because you have 2000 friends, right? But you think about it, the population of India is 1 billion. The number of potential friends just in India is 1 billion square. And 2000 is a minuscule number compared to that, right? But, but the point is that uh, we don't have that many relations that are true. It's a sparse uh, matrix that you're going to get if you build that entire model. Uh, logic, first order logic relational databases have figured out how to work with such data where I don't have a nice vector form for your input data, right? So what we have done is, uh, and this is the field of statistical relational learning and AI, is somehow figure out how to combine the statistical methods that work very well on classic vectorized problems and how can we uh, take them and elevate them to the relational uh, data, relational data spaces. And there we have learned multiple types of models. So we, we mm -hmm. learn cyclic graphical models um, where the joint distribution between a set of random variables is approximated as a product of conditionals and the quality of approximation really depends on your sampling algorithm um, that you use underneath. Um, we can do undirected graphical models. Uh, I, I think many of you will probably know of Pedro Domingos and um, they came up with this Markov logic network which is an undirected graphical model so we can learn these graphical models very effectively. Um, uh, one of my favorite papers in the recent times have been on this relational continuous time Bayesian networks where um, instead of asking if an event will happen, we are predicting when an event will happen. Right? So instead of predicting if a heart attack will occur, we will give you an expected time of a heart attack. There the idea is that uh, time is not discrete anymore, so I am not talking in terms of days and minutes and hours because if I discretize time to days, then maybe many things inside an ICU happen so often that discretizing time as days you are going to lose a lot of information Okay, because so many things happen inside a single day, right? particularly with virus spreading and so on. Um, so, but maybe my microseconds and nanoseconds are too tiny discretization. It is very hard to find the right level of discretization. These continuous time models don't discretize time. They allow and they observe an event and just compute the expected time of an event. So what we have done is shown how to boost those. Um, uh, one of my early works was on play using this uh, for learning how to play real-time strategy games. Uh, and, and again, uh, we can learn a uh, uh, rich work, uh, rich uh, way of interacting here. So you are not just looking at pixel level information, but you are understanding things like that is an enemy tower with five people. Mm -hmm. and these are four people who are trying to attack me. Maybe I should go after the enemy tower with five people before I uh, take care of these four people, right? So you can you can figure out things, and you can say things like a ballista is good for a tower, an archer is good for uh, 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 an enemy in a long range, but I need a swordsman or a footman, I guess is what they are called, uh, for an enemy who are close by. So you can learn these types of rich relational policies by um, from data by figuring out how play, people play. So we have, we have done some work on this. Of course, the thing that I'm proud of is we are really applying this on uh, many data sets, all the way from predicting uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, events uh, from a clinical study, from electronic health records, uh, predicting uh, early onset of Alzheimer's. Um, it's running on a recommendation system, and I'll get back to this uh, in a little later, um, and so on. So we have done a bunch of work on. Uh, solving real problems uh, using uh, uh, using this uh, gradient technique. So I just give you a flavor of how it works, um, just so that you know um, you, you know that it's not all hand wavy. So there is this new, uh, uh, new in the sense it's about uh, six years old now, um, by David Poole and us, uh, we came up with this idea of relational logistic regression, which is basically taking logistic regression, but allowing for non-vectorized data. So a very simple example is I can say something like, yeah, a professor is popular if he or she advises a student, okay? So, uh, uh, advises P S is, uh, uh, makes P popular, right? So, I can write this out at a formula where I can say if uh, either a professor 
uh, and advisors, and then I can have three weights. So the three weights are, um, I count the number of two instances of this class, and I multiply by the number of uh, a weight corresponding to that, the number of false groundings, you can multiply by weight and add some bias. Um, and this has a very smooth behavior compared to other uh, methods like Markov logic networks, which are not that smooth. Okay, so you need you need this kind of a, a model to make it smooth. Um, and again, sweeping the details under the rug. If you're interested, I'm happy to explain. So how does this turn? Let's say we are talking about a professor Alice. Okay, we are looking at Alice and predicting whether she is popular. So how, to prove whether uh, to f determine the probability of her being popular, you count the number of people that she has advised, multiply by that weight. The number of people in the domain that she has not advised, multiply that by a weight and put a sigmoid function that gives you an idea of how popular she is. So as you can see, as the n changes, the population size changes, the true number of population, the probability increases. So maybe after beyond a certain point, after like 10 PhD students or something, the person is popular no matter what. Okay, and you get that out of, out of this rule. Okay, so you can get this nice behavior. What we have done in what our learning setting is, we have only data about students, advised um, courses that they have taken, papers they have published and so on. And the goal is, can I learn this rule along with this class together? Okay, we want to learn the rule and the class together. So to do that, we employ this gradient boosting. Okay, so the way you do it is, you, you, you put some uh, functional form of your probability distribution. And now, uh, typical, uh, let's say, graphical models, probabilistic modeling techniques would write the log likelihood out, and then they will differentiate this log likelihood with respect to the parameter theta or p. Uh, instead, what we do is, uh, in the functional gradient boosting, because you write a functional form here, it's a sigmoid, uh, you take uh, uh, the, the gradient with respect to the psi instead of the p, okay? And there, you can allow uh, to take gradients with respect to each example separately, and this is your gradient. Um, as I said, this is the prop. This is whether the data is true in the model minus the probability of it being true. Okay. Recall the heart attack example. The prop that this is when Sriram has a heart attack. This is the probability that Sriram had a heart attack. This is when Manas has a heart attack. This is the probability that Manas has a heart attack. Right. So for Sriram, this is one. For Manas, this is zero. And this is the actual predicted. So the difference between these two becomes your gradient. You fit that in your next tree and you keep going until you can learn. And what we have shown is that the leaves of the tree, uh, there is a cross pop solution and all that stuff. And again, skipping all this, but we can learn very, very uh, powerful models. So this is, um, these are the um, the models that uh, we have learned. Um, these are the original existing uh, models that uh, don't use boosting. And in, in pretty much most of the data sets, uh, we converge to a better result, okay? And we have done uh, a lot of work on different directions in this area. Some of them, um, because of the fact that you are in a relational setting, the number of, uh, again, like, let's say I'm talking about the popularity of a professor uh, depending on the number of papers that they have published. It doesn't matter whether they have published 420 papers or 426 papers, right? Anytime you cross something like 250, they are very popular, okay? So how do you model that? So what we have done is we have built in some approximation techniques where you can uh, use them and, and, and compute fast and quickly. And there we have uh, shown that we get very, very good results in a fraction of time. Now the, uh, the recent uh, work uh, so interest what is, in... What is the nature of that uh, knowledge that about 250 is good kind of thing and, uh, and, and you know, where do you get it from? You can estimate it sensors. from the data. So you, you can estimate it sensor. from the data. So that's, that's a great question. You can actually find out the threshold in which that, that number is, becomes important just from the data. Because if you tell me that these are, of course, this is in a label setting. So I know who is popular and who is not. So I can build this model. Yeah, but that, uh, compare that with a situation where, like a uh, few years ago, like uh, the rule of thumb I used was, okay, if you had a index more than, uh, I, I analyzed all the people who got ITBLE fellow, and I found that, you know, kind of uh, median seemed to be around 30. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you use that? You know, because uh, to, to see, you know, somebody with 15 as index uh, wants to be nominated as, uh, you know, identity fellow, how do you kind of, you know, judge, uh, you know, the uh, appropriateness there? Right, so, so that, that comes out that, by these parameters, actually. Use that kind of yeah, thing. you can induce that from the data. That's where the parameter number that where you split on comes in. And we have shown that you can estimate it for some models. If I'm doing a logistic but regression, I know how to do it. Why not 
But what about if they are going to do human in the loop, where human is providing it? The next step, uh, we, will, we will show how we can take that advice. That's a great question. Next step, we will show how to do this. Um, before I go to the next step, I just want to quickly mention a couple of uh, directions that we are also working on. Um, again, um, given the interest of everyone now doing neural networks, some students in the group also want to do neural networks. So what we have figured out is uh, actually one way of um, taking neural networks and make them work on non-vectorized data. So remember, if I give you any relational database and I want you to uh, do a neural networks, the best thing you can do is construct some embedding space so that you, you flatten everything out and then work with that embedding phase, uh, space and then you get, get your uh, um, deep learning classifier to work. What we have done is instead figure out a way where for each of us, let's say you are predicting the satisfaction of working with Amit uh, or the satisfaction of working with me. Okay, So each of us will have completely different neural networks. The, the instance will be different to predict. Okay, But the model that is learned at a, at a higher level will be the same for both of us. So you learn a neural network which captures all of us in the room but personalizes it based on who we are talking about. Okay? So if you are talking about Amit and his students, you get a completely different neural network. For Sriram and his students, you get a completely different neural network because we have different grants, different papers and uh, you know, uh, different communities that we go to. Okay? So uh, I am not going into the detail, uh, but, but that is what we have done. So if you are interested, it is a recent paper, I can talk about it um, as well. Uh, I am going to skip this. Uh, we are also trying to do some uh, interesting work on causality and figuring out how to get uh, boosting uh, to do causal models. Uh, we've got some. Uh, we worked uh, with uh, a group of women in uh, Indiana, and uh, we are trying to figure out if they have postpartum depression. If they have, if we have to put them in touch with some, um, um, you know, resource uh, caretaker or, or someone who can help them out, right? Or their primary care physician. Can we put them in touch with those uh, people? So to do that, for instance, we built causal models. And, and there are some causal models that are interesting. People who are married would clearly say that marital satisfaction, for instance, depends on uh, the child care status, right? Uh, relationship problems, whether the person is a first time mom. Um, uh, turns out that educational level is important. As a father of a four year old, I can guarantee that the temperament of the infant was hugely important on whether we fought or not on a particular day. And of course, uh, marital satisfaction um, was important for postpartum depression. Um, actually, it turns out that citizens of some countries are more prone to having PPD. In some other countries, you have more social support. Um, so, for instance, like uh, India or China, there's more chances that your parents will immediately come in, they'll camp for three months, make sure that you know the, 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 the kid, the infant is at to a certain age before they move out. And also remember, we were working with a lot of graduate students in, in, in Bloomington, Indiana, and some of them did not have family support. Uh, when uh, particularly the local uh, graduate students and so you understand that you know they, they are having a little bit more chances of uh, 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 postpartum depression so we can learn these um, by looking at the data of course with some guidance from the expert but so those were the interesting uh, part so in case any of you are interested all the papers that we have talked about the code is available online um, the entire uh, I mean we built a lab web page with a lot of explanation on how to use the code uh, tutorials and videos and demos so feel free to Download it if you have any questions, ask me. Yes. So, uh, can you uh, can you move me to this idea? In this slide, um, the causality, the causal inference is possible if we know the frequency of the terms that in the conversations or communications. So, suppose we have a term which is emerging or like we talk about emerging events. Right. Right. Even like if we talk about crisis scenarios. Initially, we talk about that there's a hurricane starting up in some uh, ocean, and then over the time it's coming to the landfall. But those, like, there is some events that's happening within a larger. Event. But you are not learned. There you are doing reason. Yes. Here I'm doing learn. So I'm starting with the data set. Yeah. So I, when I, when I need a model, I have to start with the data set, right? So learning with data streams is there, and 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 I don't think it's easy to learn causal models from data streams. So you have to do a you have to have a initial model, and then you can. As, as your event emerges, you can reason about it and see if you can uh, improve it. So just to make it clear, I am learning with the fixed data set. I am not handling that case yet. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. But I don't even know how to do causal modeling when emerging. So, so how about this? If, uh, is it, I am just putting out a, 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 a kind of a procedure. Right? Suppose I have a causal model. It learns over the data. And I have, I have some literature out there which has already made some graphical models of some information. Would a hypothesis, a hypothesis, a hypothesis testing 
over the influence that yeah. my model is generating and over the information that is in the literature. I would actually do the opposite. I would start with the literature model mm -hmm. and there is a lot of work in AI called theory refinement yes. where you can figure out how to refine the theory based on incoming new evidences. Mm -hmm. So that would be the way I would do it rather than saying I'm going to figure out the, the hypothesis testing between the two models. Mm -hmm. The better way to do for me at least my personal opinion is actually start with the model that you already have mm -hmm. and now as you get newer and newer evidences maybe your R orientations change. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe newer events come in. Uh, or maybe you find that there is a hidden confounding variable that you have not seen before right. and, and that you can plug it in, right? So I think that was doing a refinement, it's still an open problem in, in probabilistic modeling, specifically in Cartel modeling. Yes. I think that would be definitely a nice direction. So did we define these terms or these terms are learned by the... Uh, no, the terms were defined. They were, they were part of a questionnaire. It's okay. a study, clinical study that we had. So the questionnaires were given to them. So, we had some scales. We looked at the the uh, literature from uh, sociology where we, we looked at these scales and we took those scales and we asked them to rate in the scale. Okay, so uh, one question was that so one the PPD is the like the end effect, okay? And there are some causes that are in the first term and there are like some middle terms. So did we define them like okay, these can be intermediate effects or not? So we didn't. We just asked them hundred questions. Okay. And and the data the model learns them and the thing is it's not a classification problem so PPD is not I mean getting PPD right is important but understanding why this how these things in, have an interplay I think that's important too yeah. so that's that's the goal here not just predicting PPD if I'm just doing PPD then just run a vanilla boost and get done right but I want to understand how or maybe I can fix a relationship problem um, which could improve my PPD through the satisfaction of marriage, right? So, so that, that's the idea, right? Okay, so moving on, I think I have about 20 minutes, so I'll quickly finish this, maybe 15 minutes. So second part is asking this question, how can I take rich human input, okay? But more than asking the question of how can I take rich input, the first question should be, what is this rich input, right? So it could be any different, uh, any of the following different ones that we are looking at. So the first one is what Benjamin Cooper has called as qualitative influence and um, or which people have done for a long time in, in classical problems, uh, um, particularly in, in statistics. We have looked at this as monotonicities and synergies. So simple things like increased blood sugar, uh, glucose level increases the risk of heart attack. Okay. So that is what is called a straight up vanilla monotonicity constraint. You can have more constraints. You can say things like increased blood sugar, uh, glucose level in the presence of high BMI has a higher risk of heart attack than low BMI. Okay, now these are called synergistic effects because they talk about how two uh, particular risk factors are going to influence your third uh, variable of interest. Okay, so what we can do is get such types of knowledge actually very naturally from humans, right? So the faster you go, the higher is the chance of you getting a ticket. It's very simple, it's very common sense knowledge. You can put this into the learning model and make your reinforcement learning agent learn better. Why should we use that information? Right? The higher number of papers, the higher is the chance of you getting a, a job. Is that, that's easy to say, right? It's not hard to say, right? And it's not always true. That's the other beauty, right? So you can have one good science paper and get a job, then 10 workshop papers in a, in a, in a third year conference. So that's, those are all different uh, things, but we don't really take these as hard constraints, they become soft constraints. The second one, probably the most important one um, that we have to think about all the time is the notion of precision versus recall trade off, right? So let's think of coronavirus or Ebola. Right. If you have, let's call positive examples as people who have uh, coronavirus or Ebola, that's the saddest part of machine learning, right? The positive example we call positives are actually socially the negative examples, right? So people who have Ebola or machine learning, for machine learning you call them positive examples. So what happens if you miss one patient with Ebola? Your system miss, misses one patient from Ebola, you cause an epidemic, right? Now we are in the US which means we talk money all the time. So that can cost me billions of dollars, okay? What happens if I quarantine more people? They're probably gonna sue me for a million dollar each, still it's million dollars. One false negative can cost me billions of dollars. One, a few false positive can be, cost me a few million dollars. This is the difference between recall and precision. So if I maximize my recall, I will never miss out a single uh, positive example. Exact opposite is LinkedIn. I was telling this to Amit yesterday. Um, I got an email yesterday morning from LinkedIn saying, 
here are some job recommendations for you. And the first recommendation said postdoctoral research associate. <laughs> okay, I was a postdoc 10 years back, so it's more like I've been there, I've done my time, I'm not doing it again, right? But that's different, right? But the most important thing is the second line said precision health initiative, Indiana University. Okay, I'm the PA of the grant or a co PA of the grant. It wants me to be a postdoc in the co PA of my grant. Why? <laughs> because it is maximizing the recall instead of the precision. It's bringing everything it thinks is relevant to me. Rather than, even if you give me four things that are very relevant, maybe you are going to attract my attention, right? So, recommendation systems are the opposite problem as that of, uh, you know, many of these clinical uh, diagnoses. So, we have to think deeply about which one is important. The third one is preferences, like Craig Boutillier has done a lot of work in this direction and we are inspired by that work and asking about preferences. A classic example that my student always tells me is, uh, is uh, that uh, uh, when his dad was uh, driving, uh, teaching them to drive, he would every now and then run through a stop sign or a red signal. And he will turn around and he will say, you should not do it. Okay, I, I did it, but you should not do it. Right? The demonstration is noisy, but the advice is correct. Right? And it's a preference. The same thing, I'm sitting on top of, maybe in Colombia, but definitely in Bloomington, Indiana, on top of this building with a donut and coffee in one hand. I'm looking at people driving. And only 50% of the people are stopping at stop signs. The rest are rolling through. What should I do? Well, the system, you should be able to tell the system, I prefer that you stop at stop signs if it's, if it's safe to do so. Yeah, if it's dangerous, don't stop. But if it's safe to do so, I prefer you stop at stop signs. So you can take such advice and then you can incorporate it in the model. The newer one that we got uh, pretty excited about is how uh, how we teach, right? When we are teaching, we give a lot of hints. We give these side uh, um, anecdotes. You, you, you give you another alternative way of thinking about the problem. But during exam, you have to answer it in one way, right? A better example is uh, diagnosing uh, Alzheimer's or something, right? So when I have it in a clinical study, I'm going to put them on variables, I'm going to have a lot of cognitive tests, I'm going to have images and, and electronic health records and so on. But when they are coming, when in the deployment phase, when I'm actually in, in inside a hospital, I'm going to have only a subset of this information, possibly just the electronic health record and the imaging data. And I have to diagnose if somebody is having Alzheimer's or to the extent of their Alzheimer's. But during training, I have this data. Okay? If I use this data directly in my model, they become unobserved here which means my model is not going to give you good results. Okay? If I ignore this data, it's based. So the question is, how can I use this data as a constraint on the model that only learns from this data? Okay? This was actually posed by, uh, uh, sorry, I missed the uh, citation, um, uh, uh, Vapnik, um, the SVM uh, father of SVM, as, as privileged information. Okay? And then Navi Quadrianto and this group has done a lot of work in vision. We have taken it and figured out how to uh, do this in the construct of learning, right? So, how do we do this? Again, a very simple idea. Let's look at monotonicity constraint. So, for instance, this is my data. It is A, it could be noisy, but it could also be uh, a lot more mistakes. The data is monotonic, which means as it goes this way, the uh, so A is monotonically influencing the value. As the data goes this way, the value should increase, okay? So, this value is 0.2, this value is 0.7, and this value is 0.5. Okay, clearly the data is violating the knowledge because it says as the value of A increases, the data, the value, should, um, the, the value of Y should increase. But from here it goes from 0.2 to 0.7. It should have been 0.9 or at least greater than 0.7, but it is 0.5 here. And there is a region where you don't have any data. Okay, and there is a region where you have a nice data. You have 0.5 here and 0.9 here. Okay, what we have done is given such data can be learned from it. Okay, so what we, we, we you can basically think of this from a, a splitting in a in a tree, and you can say the left part of the tree has uh, has to have a value that is greater than the right part of the tree, and you can enforce that as a constraint in your learning model. So what it does is this is my data, this is my advice, and I'm kind of trading off between data and advice, and we can learn better models. So for instance, in the uh, uh, you know in a pricing data set, uh, we can actually get very uh, high results compared to uh, just using vanilla data, that's the orange. Um, this is the side kits monotonicity, which is very, very opaque. We don't really know how it works. Um, and, and this is their method, this is our method. The thing that you have to see is when you have advice, such rich advice, you get a jump start, a steep learning curve, and possibly a higher asymptote. And, and that's we have seen we have seen them in all the data uh, uh, in the advice uh, systems that we are, are doing. And we have a lot of these systems out there, we do all the way from probabilistic graphical models uh, and their relational extensions 
uh, for reinforcement learning for cases in inverse reinforcement learning where we do not know the reward function um, straight up vanilla learning uh, the uh, policies uh, we have recently uh, started working on uh, planning as well and of course uh, because everyone is doing neural we also are looking at how to inject uh, knowledge in neural networks right so what are the advice and where do we use this advice potentially from clinical studies we talk to our clinicians Give us your monotonicities. Um, for the postpartum depression, what do you think? Higher stress level causes what? Right? And so we can get these knowledge uh, ex explicitly from the uh, experts that we work with. And returning on, it, the, the method is the same. The, uh, no matter what your learning algorithm is, you have one that learns from the data. In reinforcement learning, directly from the experiences, right? the Q function, the Q learning uh, equation. And you have a second term, which is a constraint that comes from the knowledge. And you explicitly trade off between the data and the knowledge. Because remember, knowledge can be noisy, data can be noisy, both could be perfect. Of course, in the case where both are bad, you can't do much, right? You can only guess. So that, that's what happens, right? So that's the formulation uh, under uh, how uh, everything works. Any questions here before I move to the last one? Yeah. I have a question regarding why you want to put the advice as a regularization to your optimization. You can see that as a regularization, but it falls out. As a regularization, we don't put it as a regularization. Okay. We add it as a constraint okay. to the learning way, and, and the way it spills out mm -hmm. is naturally uh, becomes a regularization to the data. And okay, so that's the, I mean, the causal effect, right? But I want to explain why it's good to be a regularizer because that's your knowledge. That's the knowledge which is obtained outside the data. People who gave you the knowledge mm -hmm. is, are not looking at the specific data set that you have. They are giving their knowledge based on their experience over time. So that should be used to avoid overfitting to the data that you have in hand. So it is an actually, I think that it is a very natural regularizer, but we don't have to use it that way. We put it as a constraint. In our formulation, it falls out naturally as a, a regularizer. Again, good question. Thank you. So I'm going to now kind of close the loop in, in about six to seven minutes and finish this. But the thing about humans, again, it's amazing, right? When I ask the human to tell me something, they always tell me the most obvious thing. I mean, our user studies, if I ask the humans to give me knowledge, they give me knowledge that I could have inferred very well from the data, right? So it's it's kind of like, again, I go back to my four-year-old all the time because he's uh, he amazes with, with uh, how, how kids think, right? So um, when I when I tell him something, he, he said, shh, shh, zip it, zip it, zip it. I will ask you. Okay, so the way it, I, I feel that is that's how the machine should be. When I start talking to my machine, my machine should say, zip, quiet. I'll ask you when I want a question. Okay, why is that important? I think it's important for the following reason. When you think of this as a regularizer, when you think of this as a constraint, right, as I was explaining to you guys, they become, uh, this was shown by uh, actually uh, Fung and others uh, earlier, um, and of course, Kunapli's uh, work, we have, uh, they have shown that they become kind of like polygons in your spaces. Okay, so the constraint basically says everything inside here should be blue, everything here inside should be black. So what is the nice thing? In one first swoop, you are getting lots of examples which you don't have here. Okay, this is your data set, right? Which means I could have learned any of the lines that separates these data set. But now that I give you these two constraints, only some lines are more attractive than the other, right? So what they do is they define these regions of, of uh, labels in your data set. That can actually make it a better but the thing is again humans are very good at specifying the obvious so this is the most useless constraint you can give right that, that anything inside this region is black this is probably these two are these three are probably the most useful constraints that you can get so what we want to do is let the algorithm figure out what to ask okay the algorithm could say i have a lot of uncertainty in this area how do you think it should be then the um, human could say well that is a blue region or that is half blue, half black, and then you learn from that. Does that make sense? So um, that's the way it is. So classic examples is when you are looking at election data, you could have you could come up with a question that says, "I am looking at, at uh, the the state in which the governor is a Democrat and it's on the West Coast. How do you think it's going to vote? Well, it's most likely a Democrat. Okay, you get that as input. I am looking at a state whose primary in the uh, uh, industry is manufacturing." How do you think it's going to work? And it's most likely a Republican. But how, how you get that difference. Again, it's not always correct. Okay, think back 2016. All the predictions went wrong. Right? So, um, but that's what you expect. You can put that as your constraint. Use your data and learn a better model.
Okay. So how do we do this? We are inspired by active learning, but we are doing something called as active advice seeking. So you can learn an initial model from the data. Again, we are kind of model agnostic in the way we think about it. The model could be a relational machine learning model. It could be a plan. It could be a set of inductive rules. It could be even direct straight up policies. Some uh, prediction based on this. And we calculate some form of uncertainty. In the classic supervised learning, most likely an entropy or something of that sort, right? So you form, uh, you have some notion of uncertainty. And the key difference to uh, examples is, in uh, key difference to classic active learning is, instead of selecting the best example, we can select a class, a partial plan, uh, a simple concept that I have learned, a rule, um, some set of features. Should I do this or not? You can ask any of these questions that have the highest uncertainty to the user. Get the feedback and improve your learning. The hypothesis that we have is, if this is the number of examples you need, this is the passive learning, uh, where you only learn with any human in the loop guidance. Um, by acting active learning, which is uh, allowing, there is the theoretical proof that shows that active learning goes from the NP to order of log of NP. So if, if the system chooses the example and gives to the human to learn, you can actually learn in logarithmically fewer examples, and that's great to know. Um, and also there is proof that shows that active uh, uh, learning, I'm sorry, uh, using uh, advice, you actually get even a bigger gain in terms of uh, the uh, amount of examples you need to learn. The hope that we have is if we combine these two, where we take the constraints, but let the system ask for the constraints, then hope, and we are working on the uh, theory at this point in the, in the context of probabilistic models, um, hopefully we are in the log log space. So we even need much smaller examples. Theoretically, that's been our case, right? So we've been done in the case of planning. So uh, we have this uh, experimental setup in our lab where, uh, you know, we've been doing this for 50 years, blocks work in AI, we are still not solved it. And I don't think we're going to solve it because it's actually much harder than you imagine, right? So uh, here the problem is that uh, somebody gives the system and the human uh, a picture of what they want to see, okay, the block that they want to build. And the machine and the uh, uh, human together, they start building this together, right? So, okay, let's form the L shape and put two L shapes together. We get this rectangle and build this on top. You get this tower and so on and so forth. They talk to each other. They discover the concepts. They figure out how to learn. Okay, we pose this problem as a, a, a hierarchical task network planner where at the point of decomposition, I ask this question. Am I doing the right thing? What do you think we should decompose? What should we call this shape? Are we going to reuse this shape again? And so the questions that they have, the interactions they have, um, what we have shown is that in, in many of these domains, having such an interaction, you can actually reach the highest number of problems solved in a fraction number of examples compared to the, the green where you don't have any preferences, any discussion with the human, just straight up planning. And this is where the discussion from the human is only given before starting. So before starting to learn, I'm giving you a lot of uh, knowledge and you are learning. The blue one is where you are asking questions. So as clearly with a small number of queries, in many cases between 5 and 10, <coughs> we have reached uh, very good performance, okay? Uh, based on this, again, we have done uh, some work in recently in Minecraft, this is under review, um, where for instance, the machine and the human can say, okay, let's build this tower together and then let's put two things on the side, that becomes a T. Uh, we can put an L, build an L, now we build it, bring the T and the L together and you get a new shape. Or you put two L's together, you get a new shape. So the point is that let's call this something else. So you discover these new concepts. The most important thing is you can describe by size and height. So they are parameterized. They are not vectorized. You can build them size and height. And as long as you say, build me a uh, L shape of length five and uh, width four, it goes for a longer and four. Okay, length four and width five, it goes longer on the bottom and lesser on the top. So it kind of learns uh, independent of the size of this, okay? The last problem that I'll just quickly uh, touch upon is this idea of uh, feature elicitation, where um, this is also a, a project with Indiana University, where we are looking at predicting women, uh, gest uh, gestational diabetes in women, okay? And, and which of those women are going to have diabetes, right? So when we send out a, a questionnaire and saying, oh, we need participants for this study, this was one study, we got a lot of participants, like 1,000 participants, but we have money only for 200. How can who among these thousand participants would give us the most information? And it should be driven by the algorithm, not by us choosing, right? So what we have done is we came up with a, a paper in uh, 2018 where we are looking and asking this question, how can we choose which of these women to recruit for our uh, study? Okay, so that's what we call as uh, uh, active feature elicitation. The thing is, for all the thousand women, we can give out and just collect their basic information, 10 questions on their demographic data, 
What I don't have is their sense, uh, sensor data because some of them are put in smart homes, uh, some of them have been sequenced, and their uh, other uh, data sets. So we don't have they, this data for uh, all of them, right? Um, we only have the demographic data. But maybe in a related study, we have all the data. Mom, new moms to be uh, is actually a study where we have all their data. So this is over 100 women, we have all the data. This is 1000 women for whom we have only the observational data. The question is, which 200 of these 1000 women would complement the already clinical study that we have so as to learn a better model, okay? So um, turns out that, uh, of course, our method obviously has done well. That's why I'm coming and talking. That's kind of boring. So we we'll skip this slide. So uh, to conclude, uh, I think that if you want really uh, to do AI in the wild, which is basically just deploy AI, we should go beyond vectors. We are not talking about vectors and you know, just embedding spaces all the time. We should be able to learn with graphs. We should be able to learn with multiple data types, rich relational uh, uh, structures, uh, and these are central to HAAI. Um, understanding symmetries, relations, why they are important is extremely important. Sequential models, dynamic models are also crucial. Okay. Finally, we should use the human. Right? You cannot leave the human out. Human has to be there in the decision making uh, 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 process of, of uh, these uh, systems. Right? So, of course, there's uh, miles to go before we sleep. So, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, work. First is, of course, deployment on real tasks, medicine, social science, journalism. Uh, actually, uh, one of our key projects right now is uh, we are funded by the DARPA Minerva Award, where the goal for us is to build the, what I call as data science genome. So, the, uh, where uh, machines that read and understand data science publications. So a new student walks in and uh, he or she says, oh, I want to do explainable neural networks. Um, what is up there? And then the system should not say, okay, read the AAAI 2019 paper, but say, go back to 1990. There is a work in this area, and this was started by this group. Uh, you should uh, read, uh, you know, Tawal and Shavlik on how to do the knowledge injection. And then there is a 1994 paper where they have figured out how to do rule extraction from neural networks. These papers are inspired by that paper, right? So kind of having that kind of an understanding, a holistic understanding of the literature that exists. So that's the goal of that. Of course, uh, one of our key goals has always been learning from multiple experts because if I if I have a, a clinical question, I'm going to the appropriate clinician, right? I, if I have a, you know, if I'm suspecting something about a cancer, I'm just not going to go to the family physician I'm straight up, right? You have to go for an oncologist, figure out if they are uh, telling you the, I mean, if, if you're getting the right information uh, and, and how you are, uh, um, you can plan uh, your treatment, right, based on that. So you have to figure that out, whom to ask the right question and how to get the right answer from it, right? So that's what uh, this thing. And as I was saying, um, of course, this is now becoming famous. This slide I actually made four years back, but this, this idea is now becoming famous. Uh, the, there's a nice book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, that's how I think AI should be working, right? A good hybrid architecture should be saying, at the lowest level, I have a very good perceptual understanding, okay? So I'm running many neural networks that can give me very, very quick results, but I'm going to use the uh, output of these neural networks to create my second layer, which is a little bit more uh, slower in terms of the computation, but it can understand things at a higher level. So it's much more symbolic and understands the semantics of the domain rather than just the patterns that exist in the domain, right? So why did it happen? Why did it happen? What could have changed? And I could have uh, come to a better model. So the, the nice book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks of these two uh, different architectures, and I think that they should be together. At the lower level, you have the fast effective learning. At a higher level, you have a semantic, symbolic reasoning system uh, uh, that can answer more sophisticated questions, that can allow for generalization, that can allow for transfer across related problems and so on. Okay. So with that, I am done and I can take more questions. Thank you. Um, well, your basic architecture is one Starling agent interacting with one human that provides advice or knowledge or examples or problems. Um, so, in what way have you thought about generalizing it? So, first thing is that uh, it's uh, it's not actually for one problem there is one Starling agent, but for every problem there's a different Starling agent. Okay. okay. Then, and then we also allow for multiple experts. We work on getting data from multiple experts and figuring out how to weigh the experts, how to give importance to that expert. But inside the small problem, it's a, inside the problem itself, there's multiple levels of generalization I can answer. I can ask answer question about specific professors. I can answer specific areas. 
and I can uh, talk about the higher area that you are in and I can talk about computer science as such and then the science as a field as such. So that I can answer questions on multiple levels of abstractions and the, the goal is figuring out which level of abstraction gives me the most bang for the buck. Okay, so, but each of those seem to be, I mean you have n instances of one to one interaction. Uh, so when you have multiple experts, are you considering the experts working together as well as working with your right? So I, that's that's a great question. That's a great question. We are not doing the working together part yet. Okay. We are still in the first phase. We are and similarly multiple Starling agents working together. That we can do. So we are working on multi-agent uh, systems. There are some problems where we're doing multi-agent systems, figuring out how to navigate um, and figuring out uh, how to move things around. So that is some, so we can do multi-agent start. I think that part of it is much better understood by the broader community as such. But this question of how can I work with multiple humans who work together, we have not really done that bit, right? So that that still is over. Okay. Uh, and but yeah. currently we are basically saying, okay, I have access to you, I have access to Amit, I have uh, access to her. I can ask the right question to the right person. That is what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Without wasting any of your time. How can I get the right answer? That is all we are doing right now. But let's say that I, I know that you guys have talked to each other. How can I uh, ask the right question? That requires me to understand the dynamics of the interaction between you guys as well. And we have not, you know, we have not, we have barely scratched the surface on that. Getting into the domain of deep convergent thinking, I mean, like promoting right. convergent thinking right. across, across experts. experts. Yeah, we have, yeah, let's, we have not, yeah. Yes. So, uh, you, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you have talked about a lot of algorithm, a lot of uh, ideas, but uh, you spend a very little time on a significant case study that is showing the re you really achieved the state of the art results. Right. Yeah, I, I don't have that impression. You know, can you give a, a, a very good example? So, those those show you have the one, right? better than others. You know? Okay, yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. Uh, good question. So, uh, these are the, the key uh, ones, right? So, for instance, in 1985, there is a clinical study that started uh, called um, Cardia, uh, where they got people between the ages of 18 and 30 um, in across five centers uh, headed at Alabama, Birmingham, and they they got five uh, centers. They got 4,000, I think, 5,000 subjects between the ages of 18 and 30. They measured a whole bunch of things. I, I don't think you can read this, but things like blood pressure, um, chemistries, their plasma, their serum, urine anthropology, medical history, family family history and so on and they brought them back 85, 87, 90, 92, 95 then it was every 5 years, 2000, 5, 10, 15 and now they are going to do it in 20. They have about still 3000 patients in the study. They were between 18 and 30 in 1985, so it's 35 years later, between 53 and uh, 65 and so they are, they are, they are yes, we have these data. Now one of our key successes in this story was we can look at the data between 18 and 30 to predict who is going to have a heart attack in their 50s. Who is going to have a uh, heart attack in their 50s. And you can just do this early detection by looking very early. right? And that, that to me is one of the key successes of this. Same thing with Alzheimer's, right? Uh, I, I don't have, yeah, here, right here. So in Alzheimer's uh, prediction, right, if you read a paper which predicts if somebody has Alzheimer's or is completely normal, if that prediction is anywhere less than 93%, 94%, I think we can throw the paper out. It's very easy now, just looking at the data to say if this person has Alzheimer's and not or not. But the problem is this uh, region in between that call us mildly cognitively impaired, right? So when you have severe trauma, uh, let's say I'm, I'm an assistant professor submitting a proposal, my career got rejected, you take my MRI that day, I could slip into this MCR, right? So that severe trauma of some sort can cause these uh, uh, MCI. Um, and, and so the question is, uh, figuring out which of these people with MCI will go on to have Alzheimer's. Again, based on the boosting uh, algorithm with the domain expert, we were able to make the first three class classification, who is going to have Alzheimer's, but just looking at the images, and which of the MCI patients are going to have Alzheimer's, and we got them right. And which is why I was invited to be the guest speaker at the American Society of Functional Neuroradiology twice now, uh, because we were use, doing this data just using machine learning uh, with domain input on how we can do this. Postpartum depression, I gave this example on uh, understanding the effects of postpartum depression. This allows us to clearly think about what are the causes, how can we use that, how can we bring the interventions in there. So there are these case studies, but I wanted to give a, I mean if I was giving this talk in a, let's say a pure informatics department, I'll focus on the case studies and the results. 
but because it's computer science department, I focus more on the algorithmic uh, ideas as well. But I can talk to you both more if you want to. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Hey, uh, uh, Manas will take you offline. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.